وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور In the month of Ramadan, fasting helps you to improve your bad deeds. The things that you normally do during the course of life throughout the year, you try and avoid doing the wrong things. And that may remain part of your life. The good thing that you don't do during the year, during Ramadan you want to do. That may become a part of your life. If you can abstain from smoking from sunrise to sunset, you can abstain from smoking from the cradle to the grave. If you can abstain from having intoxicants from sunrise to sunset, you can very well abstain from the cradle to the grave. And the research done that fasting increases the intestinal absorption. These were the five pillars of Islam. But these five pillars do not make up the complete Islam. As the beloved Prophet said, these are the five principles, these are the five pillars. And any engineer will tell you, any architect will tell you, that if the pillars are strong, then the structure will be strong. So if any human being follows these five pillars correctly, inshallah, his other principles of life also will be strong. The glorious Quran says in Surah Dhariyat, chapter 51, verse 56, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَاءَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I have created the jinn and men, not but to worship me. That means the jinn and men have been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to worship him. The Arabic word used is ibadah. comes from the root word abd. Abd. In Arabic, abd means slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it means a servant. So ibadah is a person who does servitude, who obeys his master. Anyone who obeys the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's called ibadah. Many people think Salah is the only form of Ibadah. It's one of the highest form of Ibadah. But it's not the only form. Following the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also Ibadah. For example, abstaining from food which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited you from having, you are doing Ibadah. For example, says in Surah Maidah chapter 5 verse 90, that, Ya ayu alladhina amun, O you who believe, inna mal khamru wal maithuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, walanzabu al azlamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rishthum min amali shaitan. These are Satan's handiwork. First, anibullah lakum tuflihun. Abstain from this handiwork that may prosper. So, if you abstain from having intoxicants, from gambling, from idol worship, from fortune telling, you are doing ibadah. Even the Bible, if you read, it's mentioned in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 20, verse number 1, it says, Wine is a mocker. In Ephesians, chapter number 5, verse number 18, be not drunk with wine. So the Bible says that you should not have intoxicants. About the forbidden food, the Quran says, in no less than four different places. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 173. In Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 3. In Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 145. In Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse number 115, it says, Hurrimat alaykumul maitudu waddamu walahmul khinzeel. Mama huilla li gairilla bi. Forbidden for you for food are ah? dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah has been invoked. These four foods have been prohibited in the glorious Quran. Dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah has been invoked. If you read the Bible, a similar message is given. It's mentioned in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 17, verse number 15, and the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 21, that you shall not have meat of the animal that dies of itself. You shall not have anything that dies of itself. That means dead meat is prohibited. And today science tells us that there are several diseases you can acquire by having dead meat. It can be either through eating, through contact, or through vectors. There are diseases such as pustular multisoda. You can have brucellosis. 
There are various diseases if you have dead meat. The second prohibited thing is blood. Hurramat alaykumul maitudu waddamu. Blood. A similar message is given in the Bible. In no less than five places, Bible prohibits the consumption of blood. It's mentioned in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 17, verse number 14. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 12, verse number 16. In the book of Genesis, chapter number 9, verse number 4. In 1 Samuel, chapter number 14, verse number 33. And the book of Acts, chapter number 15, verse number 29. It says that you should not consume blood. The third is Walahmul Kinzir, the flesh of swine. And there are various scientific reasons, etc. And I've given the talk on this. Why not to have these forbidden fruits? Why a person should not have pork? There are various diseases that you can acquire. And a similar message is even given in the Bible. If you read the Bible, in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 7 and 8, it says that the swine, though it divides the hoof and has cloven-footed, yet it chews not the cud. Its flesh is unclean for you. Thou shall not eat its flesh, nor touch its carcass. A similar message is given in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 8. The swine, though it divides the hoof, yet it chews not the cud. Thou shall not eat its flesh, nor touch its carcass. The same message is given in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 65, verse number 2 to 4 and 5, that flesh of swine is prohibited for you to have. Any food on which any name besides Allah has been invoked. Similar message is given in the book of Acts, chapter number 15, verse number 29, and Revelations, chapter number 2, verse number 14, that you shall not have food that has been given on altars or given to anyone besides Almighty God. So if you analyze, if you follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and abstain from having prohibited food, you are doing ibadah. If you love your neighbors, you are doing ibadah. As Jesus, peace be upon him, says, love your neighbors. And Quran says in Surah Ma'un, chapter 107, verse number 1 to 7. That says thou not one who denies the judgment to come, who treats the orphan with harshness, and encourages not the feeding of the indigent. Woe to those who are neglectful of the prayers and who only pray to be seen of men and do not even provide neighborly needs. If you love your neighbors, if you provide neighborly needs, you are doing ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are honest in your business, you are doing ibadah. If you abstain from backbiting, as the Quran says in Surah Hamza, chapter 104, verse number 1, Why lulli Go to every kind of scandal monger and backbiter. If you abstain from scandal monging and backbiting, you are doing ibadah. Besides worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran says you should respect and love your parents. If you love and respect your parents, you are doing ibadah. The Quran says in Surah Isra chapter 17, verse 23-24, that I have ordained for you that you worship none but me, that you be kind to your parents. And if any one of them or both of them reach old age, do not say a word of contempt. Don't even say oof to them. But lower to them your wing of humility and address them with kindness. And pray to thy Lord that bless them as they cherished me in childhood. The Quran says, when your parents reach old age, you can't even say off to them. So if you love your parent, respect your parent, obedient to your parent, you are doing ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you marry, you are doing ibadah. The Prophet said that anyone who does not marry is not of me. If you love your wife, you are doing ibadah. The glorious Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 19, that treat your wife on a footing of equity and kindness, even if you dislike her. Even if you dislike your wife, the glorious Quran says, you should treat her with equity and kindness. If you abstain from adultery, you are doing ibadah. The Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 32, that come not close to adultery, for it's an evil opening other roads to evil. If you dress up modestly, you are doing ibadah. You are doing worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran first speaks about the hijab for the man. It says in Surah Nur, chapter 24, verse number 30, that say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever a man looks at a woman, any unashamed thought, 
any brazen thought comes in his mind, you should lower his gaze. That's the hijab for the man. A similar message is given by Jesus, peace be upon him. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 27 and 28, Jesus, peace be upon him, said that it has been said of the old times that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery in his heart. Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery in the heart. So Jesus, peace be upon him, also prescribed that you should not look at a woman and lust after her. The next verse of Surah Nur, chapter 24, verse number 31, describes the hijab for the woman. That say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty, and display not her beauty except what appears ordinarily of, and to draw her veil over the bosom, except in front of her husband, her father, her son, and a list of madam, the clothes that it is which she can't marry is given. And the criteria for hijab is basically six, which is mentioned in the Sahih Hadith and the Quran. The first is the extent which differs between the man and the woman. For the man, it's from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. If they wish, they can even cover this. The second is, the clothes that they wear should not be tight-fitting where it reveals the figure. Third, it should not be transparent so that you can see through. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. And last, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And the similar message is given in the Bible. If you read the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 22, verse number 5 says, The woman shall not wear clothes that which pertain to a man. And a man should not wear clothes that which pertain to a woman. Same as the criteria of hijab. You should not wear clothes that of the opposite sex. Bible says the same. But if you go to the western countries, the men, they wear earrings. If you wear one earring, it has certain indication, you know? One earring. That's not allowed in Islam. It's even against the Bible. Why do they do it? I don't know. So if you analyze, it's also mentioned in the first Timothy, chapter number 2, verse number 9, that the women, they should dress up modestly, with sobriety and shamefacedness. They should not wear costly array and have braided hair of gold. Neither should they wear pearls and gold. They should be simple. And further it says in the first Corinthians, first Corinthians, chapter number 11, verse number 5 to 6, it says that a woman that uncovereth her head, she dishonors the head. The woman that is not covered, her head is not covered, she dishonors her head. And verse number 6 says, the woman that does not cover her head, you should shave off her head. The Bible says that, 1 Corinthians, chapter number 11, verse number 5 to 6. The woman that does not cover her head, you should shave off the head. No, the Quran, the Sahih Hadith says that, but the Bible says that. If a woman, she shows her hair, it's uncovered, you should shave off the head. If Christian is a person who follows the teachings of Jesus, peace be upon him, then we Muslims are more Christian than the Christians themselves. If you analyze that we Muslims, it's a sunnah, that we are circumcised. The same message is given in the Bible. If you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the Bible, in the Gospel of John, chapter number 7, verse number 22, that Moses gave you the covenant of circumcision. In Acts, chapter number 7, verse number 8, that circumcision has been given as a covenant to you. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 2, verse number 21, that Jesus, peace be upon him, was circumcised on the eighth day. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was circumcised on the eighth day. So if you analyze, following the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are doing ibadah. You are doing worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I mentioned, Islam means submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And anyone who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is called as a Muslim. And the Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 52, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was a Muslim. A similar message is given in the Bible, in the Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. Jesus, peace be upon him, said, Not my will, but the will of my Father. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Not my will, Almighty God's will, if you translate into Arabic, it means Islam. And a person who follows Islam, he's called as a Muslim. So even according to the Bible, Jesus, peace be upon him, was a Muslim. I would like to end my talk 
by giving the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 125, he says, Udu ila sabili hasna, wajadilum billati ahasan. That is, invite all the way of the Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Wa akhru dawan, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. I am Kairi Nisa Sayyid from Bangalore, homemaker. Jesus taught the message of uh, love and peace, whereas Muhammad allowed his followers to fight for the cause of religion. Therefore, don't you think that there is a big difference between these two religions? The sister has asked a question that Jesus, peace be upon him, taught that you should love the people, etc., spread peace, and Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam even taught that where required you should fight, etc., between the religion. Sister, if you know, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5. It says, that Jesus, peace be upon him, said, it has been said of the old times, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It was the law of Moses, peace be upon him, at that time, he bought a law. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If someone takes your eye, you can take the eye back. You have no time for justice. That was old times. Who has time? There was no court, etc. If you take my eye, I take your eye. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You take my tooth, I take away tooth. Direct. Shortcut. Everything. There's no time for you know, having a court of law, etc. But suppose a small boy, you know, he's playing with a cat, you know, and if he harms your eye. Today in this age, if by mistake someone hurts you, you're not going to take his eye. It was by mistake. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and as the spiritual leader, and the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because the people took the law literally, and I find I'm tooth for a tooth, he bought a remedy. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, that it's said of the old time, and I find I'm tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that whosoever slaps you on one cheek, offer him the other. Whosoever asks you for your coat, give him your cloak. Whosoever asks you to walk one mile, walk twain. If anyone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other. See, people took the law literally. They went to the other extreme. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him for a remedy, he went to the other extreme. That whosoever slaps you on one cheek, offer the other. It was good at that time. But I am asking, will any Christian follow that today? See, you will slap him once, okay, to show to the public, he may, he may offer the other cheek. But I'm asking you that if you go to any father, any priest, you slap, give him a hard slap. Maybe in front of public, he may allow you once. Keep on slapping, he will never offer his cheek again. Because today is not that age that one who slaps you on right cheek offer the other. Ah, by mistake, someone slaps you, it's fine, you may forgive him. But if someone willfully slaps you, and he says, okay, if that's the case, offering the other cheek, every morning I'll come to your doorstep and give you one slap. Maybe once or twice the, the father may agree with you, but he won't agree every day that you go on slapping and you offer the next cheek. He won't. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he is another messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What he brought the law, that you should judge the situation. Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 171, Do not commit excesses in your religion. It's a middle path. Islam is a middle way. That if suppose someone hurts you by mistake, you can forgive him. If someone willfully hits you, and you can hit back, the Islamic law says, if someone oppresses you, and if you can fight back, even the person who is oppressed is at fault. If someone does something wrong on you, and you can correct that person, and you don't correct, even you are at fault. The person who is being oppressed, if he can fight back and teach the oppressor a lesson, and if he does not do that, even he is a sinner. Suppose, for example, if someone creates something injustice, you can see a person is robbing, you can see a person is molesting a woman. Our beloved Prophet said, if you see any evil, stop it with your hand, that's the best. If you can't do it with your hand physically, stop it with your mouth. Tell him, don't do it. If you can't do that, at least curse in your heart. That's the lowest level of a believer. At least curse in your heart. So, Islam is a religion which is a middle path. A Prophet Muhammad Wasallam taught us that if there are evil people who want to fight you, don't get scared, fight them back. If you don't fight them back, they will harass the poor people of this world. If Allah has given you a strength to fight back, if someone is doing injustice, it's compulsory you should fight the injustice. It's a requirement. So therefore, today's law is best, is fight injustice so that peace will prevail. Because today the society has become very bad. There's so much of crime, etc. If you follow the law of Jesus, peace be upon him today, that a person slaps you on one cheek, offer the other, if you ask for your coat, give him your cloak, it will be difficult for you to live. The world is bad. So here, depending upon the situation, the law of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon which you got from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the best. Analyze the situation and then give the judgment. Hope that answers the question. I am Reverend Solomon Alagodi from Karnataka Theological College. See, the today's topic was similarity between Christianity and Islam. But what I understood was 
the differences between Christianity and Islam. I think that was the main emphasis. That's what I understood when he spoke about difference between Jesus and Muhammad. That Jesus came only for the Jews and Muhammad came for the people of all the world. I don't think that is true. That is not the teaching of the Bible. And uh, he said that Jesus is not God. And he took the convenient statement from the Gospel that Jesus said that my father is greater than I. But what about the statement made by Jesus that I am the way, the truth and the life. My father and I are one. And those who have seen me have seen the father. See, there are statements and there, are, there is in the Bible clearly stated that Jesus is God. That, that is what we believe and that is what the whole world believes. The brother asked the question first. He said that the topic was similar to Islam and Christianity and I spoke more about differences and similarities. Brother, if you analyze, I was quoting the Bible, chapter number, verse number, chapter number, verse number. I'm quoting from the Bible. What I did that there are various similarities between Islam and Christianity. But I laid emphasis on those similarities which are mentioned in the Bible and Quran which the Christians don't follow. I was not speaking about whether the followers of Christian, whether those people who claim to be Christian, whether they're following the Bible or not. In that case, it may be a difference between Muslims and Christians. The topic is not similarity between Muslims and Christians. The topic is similarity between Islam and Christianity. There's a world of difference between Christian and Christianity and a world of a difference between Muslim and Islam. So, brother, just to remind you, the topic is not similarity between Muslims and Christians. Similarity between Islam and Christianity. Christianity is based on the Bible. So I was talking about the similarities between Quran and the Bible. That Quran and Bible both say don't have pork, but Christians have, Muslims don't have. Quran and Bible both say don't have alcohol, Muslims don't have, the Christians have. Islam and Bible say you shouldn't be circumcised, Muslims are circumcised, you aren't circumcised. So I was talking about the similarities between Bible and the Quran. Bible and the Quran. Saying that Jesus says that you should worship one God, but till you all believe in Trinity. Jesus says, don't worship me, yet you all worship him, etc., etc., etc. So again, if you see the cassette, it's available, brother. I never spoke on a single differences, quoting that Bible says this, Quran is against that. No. I quoted the similar points. Similar points. When I quoted the argument, giving examples of Christian missionary who tried to prove their point that Deuteronomy 18.18 is a prophecy of Jesus, peace be upon him. In that argument, I quoted the differences between Moses and Jesus, peace be upon him. You understood, brother? But if you analyze, I was talking about the similarity between the Bible and Quran, which is the basis of Islam and Christianity. Now coming to the question, the brother said that I made a statement, and I do agree with it, and I stick to it, that there's not a single unequivocal statement. In the complete Bible, where Jesus, peace be upon him, himself says he's God, where he says, worship me. The brother made three statements that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and that life. No man comes in to be but my father. He that has seen me has seen my father, and I and my father are one. He's made three statements without references. I'll give references of all three statements. The first two statements is from Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 6 and 9. You can check it up. The Bible is here. I'm speaking from my memory. I'm speaking from the memory. It's from the Bible. You are a reverend or you are a uh, person in theological college. If I'm pulling a fast one, I've got the Bible. You know, people think that Zakir is just pulling verses, chapter number verses. The reference is here. The brother quoted a verse, I'm giving the reference. But brother, always you should check the context. You can't quote a verse out of context. Yeah, but you have to take speaking out of the context. I will give you the context. You give the quotation, I will give you the context, brother. From my memory, you can check it up if I'm telling a wrong thing. For context, go to verse number one. Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number one onwards. To 10, you'll get the context. Jesus, peace be upon him, says, in my father's house, there are various mansions. Many mansions are there. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And you know where I go it. So Thomas says that we don't know where thou goest. We don't know the way where thou goest. So he says, I am the way, the truth, and that life. No man comes into my father but by me. And I agree with that statement. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was the way, the life, and the truth. No man came unto God Almighty but by Jesus, peace be upon him, during his time. Every messenger during his time was the way and the truth to Almighty God. At the time of Moses, Moses, peace be upon him, was the way, the truth, and that life. No man came unto God Almighty but to Moses, peace be upon him. At the time of Jesus, peace be upon him, he was the way, the truth, and that life. At the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was the way, the truth, and that life. So every prophet at his time, he was the way, the truth. 
And I agree with that statement. It meant that if you follow me, you are following Almighty God. He was the way. Again, if you see, it goes further. He says that, but if you have not seen God, so then Jesus, peace be upon him, says that he that has seen me has seen the God. Means he that has seen me, means you follow my commandments, you are following the commandments of Almighty God. He that has seen me has seen God. If you see the context, the first statement gives the context that in my father's house are many mansions. He in my house there are many mansions. Giving the context, he's talking about Almighty God. It clearly mentions, if you read the context, you'll come to know that in context he was referring that if you follow me, I am the way, the truth. If you follow my teachings, you are following teachings of Almighty God. Similarly, all the teachings of prophets, whatever you follow, if you follow their teachings, you are indirectly following the teachings of God, which I have got no objection in accepting these statements. Then the third statement which the brother made is, I and my father are one. It's a statement from Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 30. Brother, you can check it up. It's Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 30. I and my father are one. Now again, I will give you the context. After context, you tell me that yet do you believe that Jesus is be upon him is Almighty God or not. If you read the context, for context, go to verse number 23. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse 23. Go. It says that Jesus entered the temple in Solomon's porch. Remember, Inside Huda is a program specially designed for you, the viewers. A program in which I'll be taking you behind the scenes to see the making of episodes, to meet the presenters, the preparers, and all those who are in charge of keeping Huda TV the best Islamic channel. Today's show is all about one special program from a very special presenter, Inspirations. That Jesus entered the temple in Solomon's porch. Jesus entered the temple in Solomon's porch. Verse number 24 says that all the Jews surrounded him and they said, How long doth thou make us doubt? If thou art the Christ, tell us plainly. I'm quoting verbatim from King James Version of the Bible. Verse number 25 says, I told you, but you believe not. The work that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. The work that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Verse number 25. Verse number 26. I told you, but you believe not because ye are not my sheep. Verse number 27 says that my sheep, they hear me. I know them and they follow me. Verse number 28. That I give them eternal life, they shall not perish. No man can pluck them out of my hand. Verse number 29. My father which give it to me is greater than all. No man can pluck them out of my father's hand. Verse number 28 says, No man can pluck them out of my hand. Verse 29 says, No man can pluck them out of my father's hand. Verse number 30 says, I and my father are one. So if you read the context, verse 28 says, No one can pluck them out of my hand. The followers of Jesus peace be upon him. No one can take them away from Jesus peace be upon him. Verse number 29 says, No one can pluck them out of my father's hand. Verse number 30 says, I and my father are one. In context, you come to know, in purpose, Jesus and Almighty God, they were one. My father is a medical doctor, actually, and even I'm a medical doctor. If I say, I and my father are one, does it mean that we are one person? No. When I say, I and my father are one, it means my father is a doctor, I'm a doctor. In profession, we are medical doctors. It doesn't mean one as a person. In purpose. It's very clear. But still, if you say, brother, no, this one means one as a person, I say, okay. If you read further in the Gospel of John, chapter number 17, verse number 21, it says that my father is thou in me, and I in E. He tells the twelve disciples. The same one is used. We all are one. If you read further, Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 21, it says, my father art in me, and I art in you. In the disciples, he says, and, and the same, we all art are one. If you say one in purpose, you'll have to believe in 14 gods. Almighty God, Jesus Christ, and 12 disciples. And if you go to the original manuscript, brother, the word used, one, out here, is the same. The one that is used in Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse number 30, which brother quoted, I and my father are one, is the same used in Gospel of John, chapter number 17, verse number 21. Same one. My father is in me, I in you, we all are one. Verse 23 says that I am in you, we are one. Again, same one. Same word. In context means 
Almighty God and Jesus Christ and the apostles, they taught the same truth, the same message. In giving the message, they were one. But if we say, no, they were actually one, then you should change Trinity into another concept, meaning 14 gods. God Almighty, Jesus Christ, and the 12 disciples. See, you read the context, you get. But even if you don't agree with the context, if you don't agree that in context it doesn't mean one in purpose, then you also have to agree that the 12 disciples were also God. Then further you read, verse number 31. Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 31, after Jesus says, I am my father are one. The Jews picked up stones to stone him. You know, they knew. The Jews wanted to kill him because good riddance. Ah, see, the Christians say he claimed divinity because for redemption. Christians said he claimed divinity for redemption. Jews said he claimed divinity for good riddance. And okay, good, we want to kill him, so we want an excuse to kill him. What's the Matthew to give the answer? Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, Many of good works have I shown you for my father. Which of the good works do you stone me for? Verse 32. You can check it up. Verse 32. Which of the good works do you stone me for? Then verse number 33 says, Jews answered, We don't stone you for good works. We stone you because ye being a man, you blaspheme it. You claim divinity. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, verse number 34, 35 says, or Gospel of John, chapter number 10, says that, Is it not mentioned in your scriptures that ye are gods? And to a person who the word of God has come, if you call that person God, the scripture is not broken. To a person to whom the word of God has come, if you call him God, the scripture is not broken. And if you have cross-reference of Psalms, chapter 82, verse number 6, it says, there that ye are gods. So if you read the context, brother, Jesus, peace be upon him, never claimed divinity. What he said in purpose, Almighty God and himself in giving the message, they were the same. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother, if you have any... Any <coughs> point to give for you can give that. No, I think you are using the Bible according to your convenience. Because okay, if, somebody, say, if I'm somebody, wrong, say, brother, say, somebody, brother, if I'm wrong, you're most welcome to correct. Somebody me. somebody asked about that question of salvation. And you, you gave that instant that no, no, brother, that, we, that young we, brother. Brother will come to that first. Yeah. Talk, talk about divinity. We'll come to salvation after I'm here, I will not go away. Because first, that's, that's related to that. Yes. We'll come uh, to that also, brother. We'll yeah. come to Matthew chapter nineteen afterwards. First, do you agree that Jesus, peace be upon here, did not claim divinity? If you say claim divinity, you have to believe in fourteen gods. You say, I understand Bible wrong, I am open for correction. I am human beings, can't make a mistake, I can make a mistake. Here is the Bible, you tell me, Dr. Zakir Naik, you are understanding Bible wrong. It's not like that, it's like that, I am open for correction. But only by saying I am wrong, laying an allegation, Islam believes it should always be given with proof. I told you you are wrong, giving proof, quoting chapter number, verse number, giving the context. You have to prove me wrong, brother, your context was wrong because of X, Y, Z reasons. Here is the Bible, brother, you can read from the Bible and prove me wrong. I am ready, I am open for correction. Don't, don't just say me, oh, you're getting it wrong. See, when we say a person is wrong, if I say 2 plus 2 is equal to 4, you're wrong. I have to give reasons why it is wrong. So, brother, I've given you my context. If you think my understanding of the Bible is wrong, you as being a theologian, you are a theologian, I agree. I'm not a theologian, I'm the student of theology only. You being a theologian, you have to tell me, brother Zakir, your context is wrong, it's not this, it's that. Show me, I'm giving you cross-references. Then we'll come to the next part of salvation, brother. So do you have any argument for Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse number 30? No. no. You, 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 you okay, fine. You go to the next. Yeah, okay. I don't agree with your interpretation. So what you don't agree? <laughs> I don't agree with your interpretation. Yeah. Okay, I've got no reason yeah. for not agreeing. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. Next question, brother. See, the, the, the next question was that, that, that person into who... The went, into the mic, into the mic, brother. That person who went to Jesus and asked about eternal life, Jesus said, you keep the commandments. Did not? Yes. That's where you stopped, right? But that story did not stop there. Yes, I'll continue if you want. And immediately that man said, I have, I have been keeping the law, I have been keep, keeping the commandments all this, my life. That's right. And Jesus said, then you sell all that you have and then you come and follow me. What does that mean? If you want to have eternal life, you sell all that you have and you follow me. That's right, I agree with that. The brother yeah, the that is very tense, but you stop halfway to prove your point. That's not right. And the brother has given the context and I know the context also. I'll give you by verse number. Matthew chapter number 19, verse number 16, which I quoted, says the man comes to Jesus, peace be upon him, he says that, O good master, what good thing shall I do that I shall receive eternal life? Next verse, verse number 17, Jesus says that why thou callest me good? For there is only one good, that is the Father in heaven. If you want to enter eternal life, keep the commandments. I stopped there. It was sufficient. Not that if you read the context, the meaning changes. The meaning doesn't change, the meaning remains the same. If the meaning remains the same, no, no, no. the context did not be... I'll, I'll tell you, the context need not be given. Verse number 18, 19, 20 reads that the man said, I have kept the commandments. So now he wants to maybe, after Jannah, how you have Jannah, 
So he says, now what to do? I have to do more of that. I have kept the commandment. So Jesus said that sell your clothes, sell your belongings, sell your wealth. It mentioned the Bible. Sell he your said, wealth, Jesus everything. You, you lack one thing there. And that one thing is that you must give all that you have, give it to the poor, and then you follow me. I am quoting from the Bible. It says, you give up your belongings and wealth and follow me. So then he thought it will be too difficult for him. Follow me, one word. Even prophets said, follow me. Quran says, Atullah, Atul Rasul, obey Allah and obey the messenger. Does it mean that Prophet Muhammad is claiming divinity? No. Every person should follow his messenger. That doesn't mean he claimed divinity. Moses said, follow me. Prophet Muhammad said, follow me. Peace be upon them all. Allah says, follow the Prophet. Atullah, Atul Rasul, obey Allah and obey the messenger. Several places in the glorious Quran. So if you are following the Prophet, that doesn't mean he's claiming divinity. It means you have to follow the message which he got from Almighty God. He didn't say, worship me. He said, follow me. He didn't say, believe that I was crucified on the cross. He said, follow me. Means follow the commandments. Same. Obey the commandments and follow me is one and the same. There's no difference. So if you read the context, you'll come to know that Jesus, peace be upon him, said, you follow me, what teaching I bring from Almighty God, and you shall enter paradise. It is not that you have to believe me, I am God, and you'll enter paradise. Hope that answers the question. I'm Shiji Thomas, working for an airline. Uh, can you explain the concept of original sin? Sister has a question, can you explain the concept of original sin? Sister of Islam is concerned, there is no concept of original sin. In Islam, we believe every child is born sinless. And the Quran clearly states that no bearer of burden can bear the burdens of others. No bearer of burden can bear the burdens of others, Quran says in several places. Regarding the concept of original sin, taught by the church, I can tell you that. Taught by the church. And what the Bible says also, I'll tell you. I am a student of compiled religion which compares both the teachings. Uh, what the church teaches, that if, may Allah be pleased with her, that she tempted Adam for eating the apple. And you'll find the story in the book of Genesis, chapter number 3. That she tempted Adam to eat the forbidden fruit. And because of that, humankind is born in sin. In Quran, the story of Adam and Eve, peace be upon them, is mentioned. But there's not a single verse in the Quran which puts the blame only on Eve. In fact, if you read for Araf, chapter 7, verse number 19 to 27, it says that Adam and Eve, peace be upon them, they are addressed a dozen of times. It says both of them disobeyed Almighty God. Both of them repented. And both of them were forgiven. Both, the blame is put equally on both. There is not a single verse in the Quran which singles out Eve, peace be upon her. But there is one verse in the Quran which speaks only about Adam al salam. In Surah Taha, chapter 20, verse number 121, it says that Adam, peace be upon him, disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you read the complete Quran, the blame is put equally on both Adam and Eve. But in the Bible, the blame is only put on Eve. May Allah be pleased with her. Saying that she tempted Adam to eat the forbidden food. If you go to Genesis chapter 3, verse number 16, it says that Almighty God says that you woman, you shall multiply and conception and bear labor pains. Means pregnancy is a punishment in the Bible because Eve disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Quran, if you compare sister... Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 1, respect the womb that bore you. In Surah Luqman chapter 31 verse number 14, and Surah Hakaf chapter 46 verse number 15, it says that we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In travail upon travail did your mother bore you, and in pain did she give you birth. Pregnancy uplifts the woman, does not degrade her like the Bible. Coming to your original sin. So what they say, that since Eve tempted Adam to eat the forbidden fruit, therefore humankind is born in sin. Every child is born in sin. I am asking the question, did Eve ask me before eating the apple? If I told her, okay, eat, then I'm, then I'm very well responsible. Did Adam ask me, peace be upon them both, that can I eat the forbidden food? When they didn't ask me, how can I be held responsible? It's illogical. How can I be held responsible? If they asked me and if I have given them permission, then you can hold me responsible. So surely you cannot hold me responsible. But the Christian church teaches that because... She disobeyed God and Adam and Eve disobeyed God, mainly due to Eve. Whole humankind is born in sin. And because of that, what they say, that God Almighty, He gave His begotten Son as a sacrifice. And they quote Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth in Him shall not die, but have everlasting life. Again, this is a commentary I can give, if you want to know, of this verse. This begotten is not then the original manuscript according to 32 scholars of the highest eminence, Christian scholars. They say the word begotten is not there in the original manuscript. So if you analyze what the church teaches, that every human being is born in sin, and they quote, the soul that sinneth shall die. 
and it's the condition of the Bible, I do agree with it. It is Ezekiel chapter 18, verse number 20. The souls that sin it shall die. They end the verse where the verse doesn't end. If you read the Bible, sister, the soul that sin it shall die is mentioned there in the Bible in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. But it continues and says, the soul that sin it shall die. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. The father shall not bear the iniquity of the son, neither the son shall bear the iniquity of the father. The Bible says, the stone that sin it shall die. The father shall not bear the iniquity of the son, neither the son shall bear the iniquity of the father. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked turns and returns to the true part, he shall not die. That is what the complete verse says. So even according to the Bible, sister, sin is not inherited. What the church teaches, sin is inherited, is against the teaching of the Bible. So if you want to know what Christianity teaches, you have to go according to the Bible. Just because the Muslim says something that women are bad and should ill-treat the women, that doesn't mean Islam ill-treats the women. To know how Islam treats the women, refer to the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. So therefore, sister, even if you read the Bible, there is no concept of original sin. Because the Bible clearly says, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither the father shall bear the iniquity of the son. Iniquity means sins. If the son cannot bear the sins of the father, how can we be born in sin, sister? In Islam, every child is born as a masoom, as sinless. Irrespective of whether he is born in a Christian family, a Hindu family or a Muslim family, he is born as a Muslim. Our beloved Prophet said, every child is born in Deen al-Fitr, in the innate religion. He is born pure. Hope that answers the question, sister. I am uh, Sadananda, again a principal of uh, the Theological College here. I very much appreciate your knowledge in both the scriptures and uh, I would uh, request our Christians as well as Muslim brothers and sisters to go deeper, still deeper into the subject, not just quoting from the scriptures. Uh, it may sound very, you see, wonderful, but at the same time study a text, go deeper into that and have some dialogue, not arguing my point, you see, I mean, uh, not, not only that, perhaps it may help us. Um, regarding, of course, the divinity of Jesus, there are other, you see, quotations also from the Bible. Uh, sometimes we, you see, when it supports our point, we may say that it is an, it's a later interpretation. For example, what, what do you think about the prologue in John's Gospel? For example, the word became flesh. Word became a human being, uh, where we where we have the concept of uh, you see the incarnation of Jesus. The word was God, the logos concept of logos. And I'm just uh, you see just to uh, ask you to enlighten these things. The brother has asked and giving another quotation, and he rightly agrees. That only quoting is not important. Going to depth is important. Only quoting and my father and one is not important. Seeing the context is important so to come to know whether Jesus actually claimed divinity. And the brother has given one more quotation, that one more place, there are various places. Brother gave three quotations, I gave the context and it was clear. Brother gave one more very good quotation from the Bible. He's quoting Gospel of John. The reference is verse number one. Chapter number one, verse number one. Gospel of John. The word was God. Verse one is uh, the beginning was the word. That's right. So you said both things. In the beginning was the word. Word was God. So you gave two quotations, word became flesh and word was God. Both you gave. So I'm going from verse number one, then coming to verse number where first come verse number one, then come verse number twelve. And I do agree that Gospel of John, chapter number one, verse number one, I'm quoting. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's a very good quotation. If you read from the Bible, if you don't understand, you should go in-depth as the brothers, I do agree with you. The in-depth, the original manuscript is which, brother? Greek, New Testament. Though Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, spoke Hebrew. But the original manuscript are in Greek. Not written by Jesus, peace be upon himself. It's in Greek. If you go to the Greek, you'll understand. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. The first time the God appears, if you say that the Word was God, just as a layman, that Word was God, that means Word is God. So now wherever Word comes, you exchange it with God. In the beginning was Word becomes, in the beginning was God. Correct? The word was with God becomes, the God was with God. It doesn't make sense. God was with God. In the beginning was word becomes, in the beginning was God. God was with God and God was God. It doesn't make sense. So if I agree that word here means actually God, and if you exchange the word and instead of the place of word, put the word God there, it will read, in the beginning was God. God was with God and God was God. Does it make sense? No. So how you go, if it's difficult to understand, go in depth at the brother said. If you read in the original, Greek, 
the word used first time in the beginning was word and the word was with god word was with god the first god used is hotios hotios meaning the god with capital g hotios the second time and the word was god is tontios tontios if you ask any greek scholar tontios means a god with a small g small g meaning a godly person first is hotios second is tontios so if you read in the beginning was the word the word was with god almighty capital g and the word was god small g but if you read in the bible both the places there's capital g who's who's done the mistake not almighty god the translators first word in greek is hotios second word is tontios so why the capital g on both the places who are you trying to deceive i'm sorry to use these words but this is if you go to the original manuscript brother the first word is hotios second word is tontios so it says in the beginning was the word the word was with god almighty god and the word was god means a messenger we agree quran says that jesus was a word from allah subhanahu wa taala was a messenger from allah subhanahu wa taala every messenger was a word from god we have got no objection at all so if you analyze i have got no objection that jesus was a god with a small g and further if you read in the old testament it says if you read that moses was sent as a god to the pharaoh god do you mean that he was claiming divinity he was sent as a god not as a messenger but the original manuscript out there what the translate is correctly as a god so if you read the context you'll understand brother that if that verse if i agree it's correct it says that jesus peace be upon him was a god and word became flesh yes the messenger came out here as flesh which the messenger in flesh and blood and jesus peace be upon him says very clearly if you go in the gospel of luke when he goes to the upper room and he goes to the upper room chapter 24 verse number 36 where he says shalom alaikum peace be on you in hebrew shalom alaikum they said and the people were shocked that they thought that jesus Christ was crucified and they believed not for joy he said that handle me and see handle my hand and feet and see for a spirit has no flesh and bones like i have that means he has flesh i agree handle my hand and feet and check a spirit has no flesh and bone indicating that he was not a spirit he was flesh he was not crucified he was alive and he said do you have any to eat and they gave him honeycomb and he ate to prove what that he was not god he was not crucified he is yet alive so i agree with you brother if you read the context and if there is a confusion difference of opinion go to the original text and the original text will come to know what is the truth how to answer the question brother because at the same uh, context the thomas says whom you quote you see i mean my lord and my god you see i mean we can we can go on discussing about these things uh, i have studied both hebrew and greek in depth i'm asking from that context also i mean i'm just uh, giving you brother has given another quotation see brother you can give 100 quotation yeah, yeah. what my point is the first quotation you gave do you agree it is right or wrong see brother gave three quotation i gave answers to all three you give two quotation i give the reply are you satisfied you know greek brother do you agree that the first time the word god is used is hotios do you agree if you know greek what is the meaning of hotios in greek the people don't know greek hotios means i'm right now okay so, so at least let, let the people know that brother zakir is not pulling a fast one agree then go to next quotation see there are thousands of verses in the bible we can discuss each and every but before going to the new one at least agree what brother zakir said in the first verse whether you agree or not If you don't agree, I don't agree with the Zakir. But Hotiol does not mean God. He's telling wrong. I know Greek. Tell me, and I'll change my statement. Just by going to a new quotation, I will give the explanation for that also, brother. But first, before going to a new quotation, as you said, let there be a dialogue. We have not come here to fight. If I'm wrong, I'll change. We have not come here to discuss. Quran says, "Tala wila kalmetin sawa'in." Buy na na buy na kum. Let come to common terms. I have been asking you. If I'm wrong, I will change. If you are wrong, you should change. we should come on a common platform in surah maida chapter 5 verse number 82 that the strongest in enemy to the muslims to the believers are those who are pagans and idol worshipers and jews but the nearest are those people who say we are christians we love you brothers but if there is a difference of opinion you come and you discuss the problem brother made another statement another quotation the first two i give the clarification and i do agree thomas said my god my god it is i do agree if you my god my lord if you read the statement like for example if the person comes and tells me like that is akid he gave you are late you have to end the program oh my god it's 12 o'clock does it mean i'm calling him god 
if you read the context, it's important. Read the context. Because again, Jesus Christ people said, don't call me good. He said, don't call me good. Where the question of calling me God comes? So if someone calls him, my God, he didn't agree. He didn't say, okay, yes, I'm God. If I tell him, my God, it is late. That doesn't mean I'm calling him God. He understands that I'm praising, oh my God, it's so late. So when anyone says, my God, it's not referring Jesus Christ, please be upon him. You are my God. He didn't say that. And when I made the statement, Jesus himself did not make any unequivocal statement. This is a statement of Thomas. Yet it doesn't fulfill the criteria challenge which I put forward. My challenge was, there's not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus, peace be upon him, himself says that he's God or where he says worship me. The brother three statement he gives all were of Jesus. And my father are one of Jesus. He that has seen me has seen my father. No man comes into my father but by me. It's from Jesus, 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 peace be upon him. But your statement is of Thomas. Yet I give you the context, which is not of Jesus, peace be upon him. It is just an exclamation. Hope that answers the question. <laughs> Da 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 da